Coming at you from Stretch Wolf Studio, it's that time again to reach across the internet. It's your very favorite World of the Apocalypse podcast. As always, I'm your host, Porter. And sitting to my left, absolutely no one. It's just me in the studio today. But hey, fear not, because we're not alone. We've got, coming at you from the south, Mr. C. Grant Rose. How's it going, everybody? Nice to be here again. And from even further south, our very own Texas Ranger, CJ. Howdy, y'all. Let's have some fun today with this. I love how you leaned into that. Very good. <laughs> how are we doing today, gentlemen? Doing, doing good. good. Having fun. What Grant said. Okay. Well, first and foremost, happy Halloween, everybody. If uh, we can work a calendar, and I'm not entirely sure that we can, this will be coming to you directly on the greatest day of the year. Happy spooky day. <laughs> so we hope you had fun at your par- whatever party you were at this weekend, and uh, hopefully you're going to do something cool tonight. You can call them tomorrow. It's totally fine. I cleared it with your bosses. Make sure of whatever costumes you or your minions wore in the Discord chat. We want to see all kinds of crazy stuff. You know what? That's a, that's a good point and, and a good idea. And of course, with that Discord, you can find the link in our forums, which is on our website over at rageacrosstheinternet.com. .com. Dot com. Dot com. There we go. Speaking of, and let's just get this out of the way, right? If you like the show, if you've, oh, it's your first time. This, of course, is a show where we talk about all things World of the Apocalypse. Uh, something for the storyteller and player alike. And if uh, it isn't your first show, welcome back. And uh, as always, if you like what we're doing, uh, we could definitely use your help. Uh, we have our Ko-Fi, where you could give us uh, some financial support, which would be fantastic. We have several levels there and uh, rewards for those of you who choose. So, and if you're not in a position to give, that's totally fair, and we understand. You know, we think things aren't great, and we get it. Uh, but you can still help. You can do that through word of mouth, writing reviews, sharing with your friends, your enemies. It doesn't matter who. Let everybody know. Word of mouth is one of the ways that we get communities like this to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And either way, new or old, thank you for being here. And I think that's enough uh, of the shilling for the day. What do you guys think? Enough shilling for the day? So yeah. uh, what did we talk about today? We, uh, we're going to go just... Go off in the deep end and go talk all kinds of crazy theories about werewolf and how much uh, I still owe you all some uh, midnight circus information for the last tale of three wolves that we missed out on. Or are we doing something else today? We're doing something else today. Although uh, I'm sure we will have another wolf tale related telling <laughs> not too distant. <laughs> I stand by it. Don't mess with me. Uh, <laughs> what we are is we're actually making good on another one of our promises. And uh, that's returning. To the uh, to the east for part three, the fabled and possibly long awaited. I don't even remember when we last did it of our Hengiokai series. We're finally going to talk about the Kitsune guys. Oh my god, it's going to be uh, lots of fun and all the different uh, version differences between these uh, particular rare foxes. Right, like no joke. Think about this. We did the Pharaoh overviews, right? Mm-hmm. We did the actual Pharaoh series. And then we did two parts of Hengiokai and never talked about the Kitsune. <laughs> All leading up to this specific episode. And oh man, is that going to be disappointing? Of course, we're not just talking Kitsune today. We've got some other stuff, some odds and ends for the setting in general. And yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the, the Kitsune, they, are, uh, they didn't get a lot of love in W20. And they didn't really get a lot of love in the third edition outside of uh, expanding them to be relevant in the Hengi Yokai uh, book. But you know, there was a lot of potential there that they didn't really go into, and they didn't really expand the whole concept of where foxes are the places. Uh, I really am interested in seeing how people incorporate the Kitsune into some of their games now that there's been, in the wild, uh, hybridization between foxes and dogs and wolves. So I think that's going to have some really interesting uh, chronicle development for some overall i mean i I will uh i will say um definitely you bring up that they didn't get a whole lot of love in 20 and then they also didn't get a whole lot of love in first edition it's kind of funny because you know the hengi okai book and and that's to be clear to everybody out there that is our primary source for this little series you know part one and part two we predominantly use the hengi okai book 
Um, and so that was, that was a second edition book. Then you had the player's guide to the, to the changing breeds, the revised, right? And they got their chapter and that's fine. But even, even in first edition, uh, where they started at the back, the ass end of the Cairns book. And that was, um, just bizarre. It was like five pages and it just abruptly ended. Yeah. I actually like that version of them the best. There is an errata out there. Uh, I think back in the day, you could have went onto the White Wolf uh, website and printed it out. I don't know I've sent it to you, Porter. I, I have it saved in my computer because I'm still old as shit and I keep everything. But yeah, they, they were definitely champions of the Worm of Balance. So I really like to dovetail them in with the Nuisha overall because the Nuisha were sort of, you know, the epitome of the wild. And the Kitsune, you know, in, in first edition for, for Karen's was it looked like that they were being built up to be like a personification of the worm of balance and be like a force, a very, very, very minor, heavily secretive and uh, hidden force for the worm of balance. So I really like that version of them the best. And for my home table, I've really went out of the way to kind of develop them that way. But you know, when second edition, I think Yokai came out, they definitely, they, they steered into a totally different direction. So that kind of, with the kibosh on most of my Kitsune stuff until I can try to uh, resolve the two conflicts there for my games. Well, I hear that. And I was actually, I was going to bring that up is that errata section. Cause yeah, I think that was one of the, I think it was one of our first interactions. Like after your first appearance on the show, I think was us talking about that Kitsune stuff. Cause I've long since made fun of how odd it was that they were just kind of shoehorned into the back of that book and how abruptly it ended. You know, it's, it's just, yeah. I, I think I used to joke that, you know, someone fell asleep and just, oops, that's where it's over. Okay. But I, I agree that I think the Kitsune from first edition is, is the most interesting. I actually grabbed a quote is because they were known as like the off, the offspring of the hellish creatures have mastered the center road between what the Geru call the weaver and the wild. They represent the worm's original function to destroy the creations of the weaver and the wild that grow beyond their borders. Of course, the uh, foxes are not consciously aware of their role, but they continue to wreak destruction ultimately for the sake of harmony. Like that's, I think that's way more interesting than what came out of uh, the Hengi Okai book. But I think maybe we pivot into that. CJ, what is their purpose? What, what's their deal in Hengi Okai? Well, it depends on which section exactly you're reading, but one of their main purposes is to bring down those who have those in power who have lost the mandate of heaven. I believe that is a fairly accurate quote. I actually, I have a little bit of that here too. Is like, I, I really kind of look at them, or at least as, as I read it. I, it, it, they came to me uh, kind of as Gaia's ninjas. Like it, it's a little, it's a little much, I think, but like to pull a quote, I do have a quote for this too. The Kitsune have used their wits, nimbleness, humor, and magic to undermine Gaia's enemies. They helped to mold the politics of the Middle Kingdom during the earlier parts of the Fifth Age through manipulation, assassination, and possession of key personnel. Like, that just strikes me as, you know, guy is ninjas. And that's a little, really, I mean, that's kind of on the nose, right? Yeah. I, I think I, the interesting thing with Hinge Yokai is that, you know, outside of, of their, their role in their, in their Hinge Yokai society, which, you know, is the assassin of corrupt individual. Um, is that they, they would try to teach lessons through laughter, which is definitely within the realms of the Nuisha. Like it even says in the Hingi Yokai book that like their their primary way of trying to uh, fix these crypt individuals is teach them through uh, some type of you know humility, maybe because humility is such a big big aspect of the culture that a lot of those uh, the Hingi Yokai is based upon. Um, and even like one of their renown is cunning. So, which is similar to the others. So, I think they, what they were really trying to do is they were trying to make an Eastern flavor of the Nuisha, and they want to give them a little bit more teeth uh, because, you know, the Nuisha don't really, they're not really uh, aggressive or warlike. And I think that was trying to do that at the same time, make it so that the, the Kitsune, while they're not the Nuisha, they also do some, you know, some ninja type stuff because it's an easy dovetail into pop culture at the time, you know, in the late 90s. Late nineties, Ninja Fever was still a thing. It wasn't quite as as prolific as it was in the eighties. You know, like when we grow up, Porter, you know, Ninja Turtles was a thing. Ninjas were everywhere. You had, 
you know, all kinds of movies out there, Jean-Claude Van Damme and Blood Sport, and every, everybody wanted to be a ninja when you're a little kid, when you're a little boy. And uh, so I think they're really trying to, like, pull some of that feeling out of the 80s into those books. And for good or ill, you know, it, it did somewhat happen a little bit, but I think it was more of a miss overall. I think they should have taken it into a more unique direction. I'm, I think I'm with you on that, but I, I think and let's let's talk a minute about the the era, right? Because uh, you you bring up a good point, you know, with uh, the idea of the Ninja Turtles and ninjas were still everywhere, but also, you know, this was I don't want to say the beginnings of anime because that's not true, right? But at least beginnings of anime as we know it here in America, mm-hmm. you know. Um, Grant and I, you know, we came up, you know, when, when this anime first started really hitting it, we became aware of it. It was like Japanimation, as it was called. And, you know, you'd be little things you'd get at the, the video store, which for some of you out there, there used to be buildings where you could go and rent movies because there wasn't streaming. And there'd be these weird black rectangles called VHS. It'd be a video or a tape is what it would be called. And you could pay money to rent that for a few days. And um, they call those cassettes yep. or VHS tapes. They were a thing, you promise. Yeah, it was this true story. And you would take these tapes and put them in a thing called a VCR. But that's the thing is like you'd go to the local video store and there would be like five or six, what we know now as anime, you know, and that's kind of how that started. And, and I bring this up because it's actually a little bit adorable is that um, one of the books I read for this episode and we'll get to it later, actually has a little blurb explaining what anime is. And this is all in the same era. You know, again, we'll get to that book. I, I see, you know, I'm seeing Grant's face here. It's a real thing. This is anime. It, it's, it's, it's adorable. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously that is, uh, and we talked about this in the early Hengio Kai episodes. It's obviously a big focus on, or in the, of the East line. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that, that big, fun, anime-inspired, you know, romp. Sometimes it gets darker, sometimes it gets lighter. And it's a nice change of pace from the world of darkness. But yeah, I think sometimes maybe they went a little too far. But it's all good intention and all in good fun. And that's an important thing to remember. Yeah, I, I definitely concur. Um, just like we mentioned in the Hingi Yokai episodes, the, the first, I don't know if I was, yeah, the first couple the whole aim overall was to bring a lot of the pop culture understanding of the Far East culture uh, and anime and these hyper fictionalized concepts that everybody was super into at that time, bring it to the table, bring it to uh, werewolf the apocalypse and see if it can be seamlessly integrated because, you know, there, there's a lot of myth. There's a lot of folklore from that side of the world that has to do with uh, different changing breeds, you know, so, yeah, we were really trying to, to bring that type of concept to the table and to your games. You know, you, you have all these different stories from the Far East that can just be seamlessly or near seamlessly integrated into your, your table as long as you had that foundation and that scaffolding provided by Hingi Yokai and the other books, you know, um, Kindred of the East and, and the, the Land of the Hundred Million Dreams. I think, I think that's what it was called for, uh, for the Changeling ones. And a lot of those other ones, they really started to, to delve into that aspect and then bring them over and make it so that your table could integrate all that stuff that we're getting, you know, freshly exposed to and thought it was cool. We we're like, hey, let's let's do all this. So I was all about it back in the day. Uh, I still really like it. I still really like bringing those fictionalized concepts to the table because it can still be a lot of fun um, to the point where I like this version better than uh, Exalted which, as you know, is sort of White Wolf's answer to anime in that regard. Um, and the Kitsune play a, a central part in that. They're, they are only in the East, uh, and they are considered like a, the major keystone of the Beast Courts in the Hengi Yokai in uh, Second Edition. I mean, you're right. The, the Kitsune are definitely... Um, I mean, they're the focal point of the Hengi Yokai. Like, like you said, they can, they can only be... They're only Hengi Yokai. For some reason... Despite the fact there are foxes every damned where, you know, there, there's, they are only Hengi Okai. The other foxes are an illusion. They're a figment of your imagination. They don't really exist. Like birds? Just like the bird. Yeah. <laughs> there's no birds. But then on top of that, um, and they worked this into the origin of the Kitsune. 
All right. I know we're kind of jumping around, but it's a Hengi Oka episode. Just, we're going to be all over. Um, it, it's something that they, they messed with, or, or maybe not messed with. It's, they're weird. All right. The Kitsune are weird. And they yeah. worked it into their origin, but, you know, by, oh, they were the last ones created, and they were created pretty late in the game, you know, the relative uh, history of the world of darkness. And, and so Gaia and Luna weren't at their full power. And that's why, for example, they can't regenerate. And not only can they not regenerate, but all they do is take ag. Yeah, those poor things are super, super squishy. Hey, right? So. Yeah. Like, I'd say it's worse than humans, but it's not worse than humans. It's the same as humans. And I mean, yeah, they have gifts that can make let them heal themselves, but that's all they got. You know, silver don't work, but that's whatever. It doesn't matter because it's all ag anyway. I mean, if I can still use a big ass club and just club you to death pretty easily, then why do I need silver? It, right. Also, that's what happened to the wear baby seals. So, <laughs> I will say the like not being able to soak ag and all that and being just generally squishier does lead into the. These are more guys ninjas because yeah, these are the guys who never who want to have all of their objectives done before they can be hit. So. Makes sense why they might be just a little squishier. Then again, these are Farah, so it's still odd. Right. Like, I don't... It was always my problem with Hunter, right? You know, I've said before, I've never gone bowling and wanting, wanted to be the pins. You know, I played a few games of Hunter. My character got his leg broke and then was in a wheelchair for a few games. Not, not my idea of a power fantasy. I think one really interesting aspect of the Kitsune to kind of dovetail in with all that is the fact that out of all of the Pharah, they're one of the few that really embraced uh, like hedge magic, right? They're, they're super into the hedge sorcery. And so that obviously dovetails into a lot of those, you know, 80s and 90s shows based upon ninjas having mystical powers and being able to do spells and stuff like that. So you really integrate that into your game and they have those rule structures there to support that. So like, if I'm wanting to have a, a Kitsune in my game that's going to be a follower of the Way of Shadow or whatever it's called in the book, I can't remember. I'm definitely going to give them some some hedge magic that's going to support that endeavor. So even though they're super squishy, they will have some bite to them. More, be more like a glass cannon. Uh, unlike hunters, hunters they're just kind of even if you give hunters lots of edges and they become a glass cannon, the fact that they are so focused in on one parameter almost inhibits them against a uh, those types of, of cross games like that. Well, and we'll get into to hunters a bit later. That I mean, that'd be an awesome segue if we didn't just get started, right? <laughs> <laughs> but another thing, I mean, you mentioned the the magic aspect. It's important to note it, that um, the Kitsune can learn gifts from other changing breeds, even, which can be a little hilarious depending on what gifts you have them learn. Mm. You know, like, oh, they can do the, the Corex one where they can throw feathers that are, like, what, somehow, right? Like, that's already fun. <laughs> Your fox can produce feathers like knives, and okay. You know, yeah, like we said we they can't regen. Uh, everything is ag, so that's awful for them. Also, when they're born, and this is a weird thing, right? Someone's going to die. Yep. Um, usually it's the, um, if there's, if there's a Hamid style parent here, that's the one that's going to go. Usually Fox born parents are fine, but it, it, it's, you know, they, they still can. And then in the, the case of a Metis, you're losing a Kitsune, but mm -hmm. for one to be born, someone going to die. And that's, um, interesting. And I think that's an interesting take. And if I remember correctly, their Metis don't have any physical deformities, in exchange for having a parent have to die. Um, that, I mean, that's true. Uh, also, they only have a, a one in five chance of creating a Metis. Kitsune, Kitsune kids, only a one in five chance. But yeah, one of the parents is going to die. And it's interesting. I, I noted too, is like they, they tend to be perfectionists, the Metis um, of, of the Kitsune. And they're a little insufferable because their whole lives they have been raised um, and told that they are magnificent creatures, like right from Jump Street. Mm -hmm. So they're the specialist. They can't breathe poor people air. They're destined for mansions and mansion land. And they, you know, in their whole life. So they're, they're just the worst to deal with. 
But it's also uh, worth noting that the uh, the fox lupus, uh, like the Roco, uh, they tend to be pretty curious and have this massive thirst for knowledge, while the the their homids, uh, the cogen, are super arrogant. Like apparently they've always they've grown up always knowing secretly that they were special, and then finding out their kitsune just confirms it. So they also cannot breathe poor people there. Yeah. I can dig it. I mean, you know, if I was kitsune, I could dig it. I'd be like right there. I'd be right there with him. Like yeah, I'm pretty badass. And I got a, I got a fancy tail, so get wrecked. Potentially more. <laughs> like, the whole how much the Kitsune are kind of, like, made to be super arrogant and insufferable was honestly one of the things that made the Hengyokai version of them hard to read at times. Like, I'm going to be honest, it was hard to get through it with how far up their own ass they were at times. Yeah, that's. I don't blame you. It's perfectly fair. Um, and from like a, and that's the thing for me from a gameplay perspective. You know, mm-hmm. like is a is a storyteller or is someone who would uh, ideally, you know, someday whatever, be at the other side of the screen. And and to have we're the guys that explode on contact. You know, we are the the glass cannons, but we're going to emphasize the glass. It's like, man, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should calm down. And I mean, even mm-hmm. talking about being humble is part of their litany, which we'll get into again later, I think. So, I mean, it would be so, nice. <laughs> I looked at it from the perspective that they're all arrogant and insufferable like that. From any of, you, you look at bureaucracy and you look at a lot of members of bureaucracy. Take our Congress, for example. There's members in any political structure where people outwardly vocalize and act like they have this sense of entitlement for their position and their extent of clout, political or cultural clout. And that's how I looked at it when I was reading the book. That made it a little bit easier for me to stomach as to why it is. And for me, it read more as this is the face that they, they um, you know, have for the general public and the, their political structure that they're in. And then they also have a private... A uh, face that they share amongst their, their closest loved ones in their pack and things like that. So it made it a little bit easier to get through. Uh, and then, you know, looking at the different NPCs that they, they listed in the Hengio Kai book, some of those are really awesome, you know? Yeah, sure. And it, it's like, I, I would like to agree with that, right? I mean, like, no, it, 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 there's no hive mind. We know that. And, and if you're doing these characters right, there's a difference, you know, like no, no one's the same. There's, there's, you can look at a template character, but these characters aren't fucking templates. So, you know, there's there's definitely room for that. But I think the book does kind of double down telling you that these guys suck. I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, you know, not is uh, like his people, you know, like I said, this thing about the arrogance, uh, the thing about the, 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 the Remetis being insufferable. I pulled those directly, you know, and I think your your take is is better and definitely makes it more palatable. But uh, looking at it from the other side, from the back of the screen, right, from the storyteller standpoint, the fact that they they make a point to say that, I think, informs not your player characters, but as a storyteller, how you're putting those guys together, which doesn't necessarily yeah. invalidate your take there, Grant, but it's your, it's your springboard, because obviously, unless you have some really close NPCs that happen to be Kitsune, what, why, and how, you're going to get that surface level. Yeah, I, I, I get that. Um, I can't remember how much W20 deviated from that uh, that insufferable perspective. If I remember correctly, I think they softened it a little bit. I think a lot of that was just... Uh, I think maybe some of it was just the the page count and the, the inability at the time to really articulate how, how the NPCs should be to really make it a little... And that, that's kind of like they just phoned it in when it comes to that. It's easy to say, hey, this person's insufferable. This, these people are insufferable, so all the NPCs should be insufferable. Uh, instead of, hey, they should have you know, two or three different societal behaviors that you would need to incorporate into one character. Um, so I think they just phoned it in for simplicity's sake to make it a little bit easier for, you know, for a storyteller to kind of jump with it. Um, and especially with the Hengi Yokai, I think the 
the general perspective was storytellers that are playing Hingi Yokai games are already playing uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse. So they're already relatively experienced storytellers and they'll be able to read between the lines and try to add those those layers of dynamicism into those characters. But yeah, you're right. Um, they could have done a little bit better job in detailing the the dynamic breadth that these people, these characters could be so that newer storytellers could seamlessly incorporate them into their games. Um, and if you take into to account, like, uh, I can't say the, the NPC is named properly, but it's like Bay Mian Z. It's the white-faced one. It's considered the original uh, nine-tailed fox and like the first Kitsune. And if you look at the story that they wrote for her about how, you know, she had this interplay with Gaia and tried to trick Gaia, but Coyote already you know, top guy how not to be tricked, and then how she come back and messed around with all the rest of the world of darkness. You know, with the Wang Wang uh, Wang Chi and the Wraith and Hissen and all these other people. They added these different layers, and they don't really go into her acting like that she was this insufferable creature. They just add all this different stuff that she did and made it really dynamic. Well, it's funny that you you bring her because I and I felt like we should have probably started with her with the white faced one. Um, we didn't, so that's fine. <laughs> but yeah, her story, and, and this was something that I thought was kind of interesting too, was, you know, um, for, so for a quick background on that, you know, your first Kitsune, uh, uh, by me on she is what I think, but I don't know. We'll fucking roll the dice on that. But the white faced one. Yeah. You know, she's taken to, uh, she's taken by Luna to go see Gaia you know, and she's told of her people's destiny to grow up and serve Gaia. And so she tro- she shows up and right and tries to wheeze a lot of the Gaian mandate. Like immediately. And I mean, of course, it doesn't work out. And then Luna gets involved and there's more weaseling, which is it's look, it's interesting, right? Because we're learning about nature and how foxes are just shorter weasels with like both more and better tails. I mean <laughs> more and better tails. Well, yeah, there's there's multiple tails and it's a better tail than a weasel's tail. I mean that's I mean, it's opinion, but I, I think a fox's tail is better than weasel's tail. But apparently, they're the same thing. But ultimately, this changes in the Kitsune. You know, they, they like I said, they really end up being like guys and ninjas. Um, I mean, there's way more to that story, but I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, it's a long story. Well, it's really, I didn't have fun with it. Like, I like the Hengiokai. We, we talked about this a bit before. And mm-hmm. I'm sure it'll get brought up again, you know, and, and to go a, a step further, we take a fair amount of shit around our, you know, ar- around our AI studios here and, uh, about how we hate the Pharaoh, which isn't true. We dislike the Pharaoh being used super freely in a standard werewolf, the apocalypse game, right? We, we reject the idea of, and I say, we, I'm speaking, I'm not speaking for everybody here. But, you know, say, I, you know, I, I reject the concept of your, your mishmash, Farah, zoo force kind of group in the Western werewolf, the apocalypse setting. It doesn't make sense. It contradicts a lot of things and brushes the war of rage under the, under the rug. It's a problem with me. The Hengioka is a different animal, though. Different animal. I'm, I'm fucking, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a different thing entirely, though. <laughs> You know, this is a chance like the Ahandi of you can use all those characters together and all those different races together. And that works. That works with the setting that works with the lore. It, you know, so great. You know, there's, there's some really cool shit that come out of the Henki Okai. There's cool. So even the Kitsune, you know, I mean, we're not slagging them off. This is a much better setting and a much better way to do it. And I think that for that type of thing, yeah, the, the combined Farah games, I think you really have three, maybe four, depending on how flexible you want to be with the lore, um, areas, you know, geographic areas, and where with the apocalypse, like geopolitical areas, uh, available to you. So you have the Amazon and the War in the Amazon. That's pretty wide open when it comes to cross fera games. Even though there's no actual political structure, you can go pretty far into that, especially like the Balaam, and the Mokole, and even the, Naka, the Naga, and a few others, depending on how, how you want to look at it. You can make a pretty good game down there with minimal effort and minimal lore and conflicts. And then in Africa and the Far East. 
you know, all three of those locations, it's pretty easy to, to make those cross fair packs in, in games and have them make sense in the canon and the lore. Right. And then the to jump through or mental gymnastics to make it work. Right. Right. And my fourth one that I've had, I had played one game with it. I ran one game with it and it was really cool. And it took a little bit more preparation because there's a lot less information on it was Antarctica. I actually had a game because I wanted to incorporate where sharks into the game. Cause I had one guy that really wanted to play that wrote their okay. <laughs> and for me, canonically lore wise, it made the most sense um, to have a game focused on uh, Antarctica. And, you know, there's a bunch of research centers down there and have the game around them trying to figure out the, the claw of the worm that's hidden there and other uh, super big bads that are possibly sleeping underneath the Antarctic shelf there. And it really worked. It really worked. It's one of the few games that I had Rokea and incorporated into it that it, it really worked really well. But yeah, the Kitsune, they're still locked in that one area. And that, and that does bother me. You know, because again, we, we're in a situation where there are foxes all over. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, I would have done it differently, but we're not talking about what Porter would have done had he had had the chance to write it for the first place. That's not what this fucking show is. I just would have, you know, I, I don't know. Like, they do make mention in the, like, section where it talks about the other continents and stuff that there are kitsune who do travel there, but all in all, it usually summarizes to, like, yeah, no, we go there occasionally, but there's not much for us there. Like, Africa, or Africa, there's not really a huge fox population. Europe, it's a lot of angry old Garu. And then North America, it's like, yeah, this would be the perfect place for us, but the coyotes are already here. Which, like, they're not part Roadrunner. What's the big deal? You, you can have both. Fuck. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So they did kind of, like, pigeonhole themselves into being solely in the East. Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a common criticism that I have, I've encountered throughout the community is that the foxes are cool. They have some really cool ideas, some concepts, and but they've locked them into the Hingi Yokai uh, structure, and they didn't really give them any avenue of how to get out. And that's, like I said, that's the reason why you know I work really hard on my table games to kind of make them and the Nuisha, who also are criminally... Uh, under detailed in the world of darkness into a more comprehensive type of two sides of the same coin fairer group so that I can justify having Kitsune somewhere where a new issue would be and vice versa. So I wouldn't think you'd have to go too out of your way for that. Yeah. I think ultimately, you know, they got legs. It's a modern day setting. People, people travel. And this is one of these things. Um, and this isn't about the Hengi Okai. In fact, this is aggressively the opposite. But I've long said, I, I think it's, um, they've, they've leaned too heavily on the human societies in a modern day setting in terms of at least Garu tribes, right? And, and I think I believe they brought something up to this effect, even as far back as second edition about how, yeah, once upon a time in, in the earlier, you know, versions of the world, right? In human societies, the Garu would cling to a particular group of kinfolk because it's what was near them in the region they were in. And that's how this all started. But humans have migrated since. We, we've invented like boats and jet planes and automobiles and travel. And humans travel and they screw. And these are two universal truths. So, you know, that, that line of um, leading to a particular culture with a tribe or a breed, I think, um, to an extent, is, is overplayed and overemphasized. As we bring up, there, there are human kinfolk like humans are everywhere. So you can just pick one and go. It doesn't have to be a kinfolk, right? Um, in terms of the lupus kinfolk, be that like wolf lupus or fish lupus or bird lupus or, you know, that, that snake lupus, snake lupus, <laughs> fox lupus. Yeah. That could be a little different, but again, there's foxes everywhere. There are snakes everywhere. There's no birds, unfortunately, but you know, you, you have more options then you're led to believe, you know, I think that, that, that always that tying so close to a particular culture, human culture was a mistake in terms of the Pharaoh, you know, butting heads that rubbing up against in games in the past, all of that. Absolutely. But it, it shouldn't be so, uh, um, 
What's the word I'm looking for here? You shouldn't be so pigeonholed to a uh, human civilization. Yeah. Yeah. I'm tracking. I, and I agree. Um, and I think that you're going to hate me for saying this. I think that the tact they took with the tribes in Forsaken was a step in the right direction. And I think they should have taken that same ideal and applied them more to the tribes and the Pharaoh in War of the Apocalypse and kind of went with it. It would have been a much more dynamic game whenever the revised edition come out because they already started changing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, like they changed the Stargazers, for example. You know, the Stargazers on the surface level were based on, you know, Tibetan cultural understandings from the 80s, which was almost nothing. So because it was almost nothing, it sort of went into its own direction and became their own thing. Um, they should have just followed that through and just kept it up, especially with the Pharah. Like, why have the Pharah locked into any type of human culture civilization, especially for uh, worldwide creatures like the foxes? Foxes are worldwide. They're, they're everywhere. Um, so there really was, outside of them basing it on um, Asian folklore and mythology, no reason for them to, to pigeonhole it to that particular um, those, those particular cultures, they could have really taken advantage of that the fact that the animals everywhere and made it its own cultural thing. And I think they sort of did that in first edition in Cairns where they were just, uh, um, followers of the worm of balance. And, you know, they just didn't, uh, didn't follow through, unfortunately. I'm definitely with you, you know, um, and, and I'm speaking for the whole game at large at that point, right? Your first edition, your second editions, it was definitely the, the way it was going. Like I mentioned, I am almost positive. There's that blurb when they talk about the tribes about being tied to the original cultures, but obviously humanity is, it's, it's not that way anymore. Um, and that's always stuck with me because yeah, in revised, they, they sort of doubled down on the human, the human culture relation to things. And I, and I do, I feel that was a mistake. You know, um, we don't do a whole lot of talking about W5. Uh, for various reasons. I mean, really, it's a spinoff. It's a different thing. Um, but that was something that they got closer to right. I, I am, look, I'm a harsh critic, but I'm a fair, I'm a fair fucking critic, and it's something they did right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I concur. And that's whenever, you know, whenever that topic does come up, uh, I've been a very vocal proponent of saying that W5 should have been rebranded and been, been called Werewolf the Retaliation, and they should have walked hand in hand with the board game guys and it would have been such uh it, it would have been it would have went over much much better with the the older uh, fan base of world of the apocalypse but yeah that that focus on non-human based cultural aspects for each tribe is definitely what i would do for um any of the hingi yokai but especially the kutsune uh, if i was you know old enough back then to contribute to these types of things Oh, for sure. I, I would have taken, yeah, I would have taken them a different way. And so, like, I, I think that first edition look to them is much more interesting, for sure. Um, but tying them, uh, yeah, exclusively to the Hengi Okai when you have a world full of foxes, you know, Bastet have nine tribes, for crying mm -hmm. out loud. You know, and, and honestly, I, nine tribes of Bastet. We couldn't do multiple tribes of foxes. You know, or at least two, the Hanky Okai and the non Hanky Okai. I mean, but even then, right? I mean, if they're going to make, you know, we, we get different tribes of bears, we get different tribes of, of Garu, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, we couldn't do the same thing with foxes. We easily could have. They just chose not to. Now, yeah. I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. Um, like I'm torn on it, right? Because again, you have all the, the attention the Pharah get in a game named after werewolves and. I get it. There's cool things about the Pharaoh, but the game is werewolf and not zoo force. It's not fair of the apocalypse. Um, so I get it. Uh, but Hengi Okai has the unique, uh, disposition of being its own thing. You know, it's part of the, of the East subset. And that's really, it's a, it's a different game, basically, you know, and so they, they had the opportunity. Um, I don't know. I just think it was a mistake. Um, but that's, you know, that's what could have been, not what is. So considering that we're working within the restraints of what was already made, um, one thing that I do that they did do for the Kitsune that they didn't do for some of the other Pharah is they did two different things that are really interesting in my opinion for games. 
So one, they, they have a gift where, all right, so yeah, so when the Kitsune, when they don't have any moonlight touching them, they can use a gift. Um, I think it's called the moon dance or something like that. And so the Kitsune, whenever they do their moon dance, or, or I think that's the name of a gift, they can actually become invisible. And moonlight, as long as moonlight's not touching them, they're completely invisible. Which that has a lot of game ramifications if you're running a game that the antagonist is the equation or kindred, uh, or even just creatures that prefer to move around in the daylight because then they're completely invisible. Counterpoint to that is moonlight is just sunlight bouncing off the moon. So you kind of need to suspend a little bit of your disbelief to have that work for you in your head. Um, then the second thing that I really like that gave them a little bit more flexibility is that they can speak to the 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 go the shadowlands the the asian equivalent of of the underworld which they call the yang world um and they can they can speak to them so you can have these crossover games with um the wraiths of the the far east which they, they are different there's a lot more to it and neither here nor there for that to go into that discussion but Eastern rays are are drastically different than the ones in the Western side of the, of, uh, the world of darkness. So having that where you can start incorporating those cross flat things more seamlessly gives it a little bit more flexibility. Um, cause I mean, we're, we're going to lament the fact that they didn't make them a worldwide thing all day long, but we have to work with what we got. Yeah. We, yeah, we've been confusing the issue a little bit talking, uh, you know, about worldwide. I mean, this is about Hangi Okai and right now we're talking Kitsune. Sure. Um, but it's, it's something you pointed out, Grant, is like how the wraiths of the East are very different and the Kyujin aren't just normal vampires. And there's something with the mages. I have no idea. And I know there are changelings. Like everything is different over there. And mm. I, I think, I don't know if it was a byproduct of the time or it was intentional. I think a little bit of both, right? But as we brought up before, the Hengi Yokai, um, and not just the Hengi Yokai, but the, of the East, you know, the Eastern setting in the world of darkness is much less based on history than it is an idealized version thereof. It, it's your Hollywood anime infused, possibly directed by Michael Bay or mm -hmm. the better version, maybe. Um, <laughs> it's a lot more the pop culture than. Yeah. You know, history. I, I feel bad bringing Michael Bay into this now. I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> but but it, uh, John Woo. I feel better about John Woo inspired. Yeah. You know? Yeah, sure. Um, and I think that is actually to the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. You can get away with a lot more interesting things, especially in like the tr the Farah and everything over in the East, if you are going more off the pop culture. I mean, after all, the Kitsune can grow multiple tails. Which, by the way, is tied to their rank mm -hmm. and their longevity. Yep. Which is crazy. Yeah, I like the fact that functionally they can be immortal as long as they don't die. Right. Like as long as they're immortal, as long as they don't die, it's perfect. But you know, they they get a rank, they get a tail, then they hit the um, you know the legendary rank, which they don't really go too deep into. I don't know if W twenty actually gave gifts. I know um, Cairns didn't have gifts up that high for them, uh, but you know they, they get to that legendary rank, that rank six, and they're functionally immortal. They they live forever. Old age is not going to happen to them. They're not just going to get cancer and die. Um, so that can really make some interesting stories because you can have these Kitsune from like around from like the Boxer Rebellion and, you know, that type of history. And maybe that was their first exposure to to Westerners and, and Western fairs coming in at the time. Uh, and you can really run with that, make some really interesting games that way. And that's a super cool idea. Although I think they could totally get cancer and die because they can't regenerate. Ha. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, like every rank they get, um, they they get another tail, and it like it effect effectively doubles their lifespan. Um, so you're absolutely right. Although, like their rank system isn't the same. Like it's similar, but it's not the same as like a Garu one. So rank six is not the end. Um, they can mm -hmm. get like the. I mean, they're called the nine tails. They can get nine tails only. Uh, you know, only one ever has. 
but it's possible and it should never be your character and it probably shouldn't be an NPC you made up either. Please don't do that. But it's, I mean, it's, it's possible. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to write one up just for you, Porter stats and all. Is this, uh, is this going to be another black dog, C grant tulip or B grant tulip, um, creation? That was it, right? That was your world. That was your, uh, black dog version. I mean, if it wasn't, it is now. Well, we talked about it in the, the multiple wolves, which Aim. for us <laughs> just aired. Yeah. Something along those lines. Sure. It's going to be a Kitsune with 12 tails. Oh shit. Just breaking barriers. <laughs> All the way out. Did he, did he sew the others on, or did he hear them legitimately? I don't think it works. I think it's just you, you sewed the tails on. It wasn't exactly like a skin dancer, just like I have some tails and I have a staple gun and fuck it. <laughs> I don't know. Danny said apparently you can buy fox tails now and wear them around just as a person. <sighs> did he try to send I, me a link? I'm surprised Danny knew about that, but I remember seeing those with some of the kids at my uh, high school when I was still there. Oh, no. Yeah. So the Kitsune have their own litany. (laughs) (laughs) Before before we move on to the litany, something I do also like about the Kitsune, and if I was like a storyteller or an assistant storyteller in a game, is they have something called paper magic where they can trap uh, spirits like Little Cammy. And depending on your interpretation of the books, uh, even like Gorgons or drones or even the, the big guy Kami into these uh, methods of origami. And the fact that they can do that can really have an impact on your story overall because maybe you have a favorite spirit or even you know a Gorgon buddy in your pack and they get too close to the east and then these Kitsune decide to just trap his ass and then use it against you. So... Say you have a storm crow that was your bud. All of a sudden, now he's a little origami crow, and he's being used to attack you. I now have an image in my head of a ton of bane tender, like carving the skull of one of their fallen pack mates to be used to bind a very powerful bane, and a kid today just coming up with a paper crane. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I've always liked that um, that image. You know, the, I've always liked the paper talismans, and I like you know we've seen in in various. Um, I've seen. I don't know what you've seen. In various mm-hmm. anime, you know, the, the stuff, the, the idea of the, the paper cranes and the, you know, the origami being weaponized. So I think that's really cool shit. And then again, that's, that's, we go to influences with that too. But maybe, um, before anything else, maybe we, we drop a real quick on the auspices, um, or the paths for, mm-hmm. for Kitsune, of which there are only four. And I mean, we don't need to make a meal out of this. Um, obviously the, the book is out there and we encourage people to check out the books if they're interested in this stuff. But, you know, you've got your, your four, the Doshi, which are sorcerers, the Eji, which are warriors, the Gakutsuke, Sushi, fuck, <laughs> Dreamweavers, yeah, that one again. <laughs> the, the Gukutsushi, which are the Dreamweavers, and the uh, Kataribe, who are bards, or barbs, if you read my notes. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's simple. It's It's kind of right there. We all know what those... Not the Japanese ones, but we know what the normal words mean. We can we can fill in the uh, the lines there. And if I remember correctly, these auspices or the paths are determined via a ritual that is done with the new kitsune versus like any sign that they were born under, like a specific moon or that. So yeah, like the result the- of this ritual is the path. Yeah, I think they. I think you choose whenever they get their first rank. The rite of passage. Is that it? Yeah, rite of passage. There we go. Jesus Christ. So yeah, whenever they complete their first rite of passage and be you know get their actual rank one, then they choose their path. What I do find about interesting about the paths, you know, you have those four, and the big thing though is that they're still they still use the they're based on the four elements of Western elemental understanding, like alchemy. You know, earth, uh, air, fire, wind, or water, right? But that's not the Eastern understanding of the elements. The Eastern understanding had five. You know, you had wood, metal, earth, or uh, air, fire, and water. So why they chose to go with the Western elements instead of the Eastern elements for these types of path foundations, I would really be curious to see those notes and to see in the, the, the mind of the author when he was creating these. 
but yeah, they're, they're, they're really cool. I really like them. And I do like the fact that they're aligned to like a combination of two elements, like the warriors, like earth and fire, the sorcerers, air and fire and so on. If I were to hazard a guess as to the why, and this is irresponsible speculation, I want to make that clear is, is I would blame the era of which it was written, you know, uh, people tend to forget, right? And like, I know you're not one of them, but people tend to forget that these books are, they've been around for a couple decades and, um, the world as we know it now is not what that world was. And I mean that in many ways, but in sp- specifically right now, I mean, internet access, you know, um, people used to give white wolf a lot of shit for historical inaccuracies. And I always cut them slack on that for two reasons. Number one, the world of darkness is not our world. So if there's deviation in the history, that's fine because it's not our world. I mean, that's how I saw it, right? However, the other part is when they were doing the research for this stuff, they were using a damn card catalog at the library. They couldn't just mm-hmm. Google it and get the answer. And even around the time when Hengi Yokai was being written, the internet was, you know, more prevalent than it was when first edition was more written. But it still wasn't everywhere. Google still didn't exist yet. Or, or it was still a lot slower than it is now. Right? Like they were going to Yahoo or they were asking, they probably weren't even asking Jeeves yet, which was my favorite. No one remembers Ask Jeeves. It was the search engine where you asked a virtual butler to Google something for you. Right? Like you were, you were on Alta Vista or whatever and doing something through Yahoo. Like it wasn't as easy to do the research is my point. <laughs> so. You know, that probably, I think I mean, if I'm going to speculate, think, it's going to be why. You know, sometimes the Dewey Decimal System did not come in for the win. That's for sure. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. I think, I think that's why. I don't know that, but that's probably why they went with the, the Western elements rather than. Because it was just much easier to get that research or they couldn't find what they needed. Yeah, that's fair. I, I, I can see that. I think they still made an attempt and that's really cool. And the four paths, uh, they, they don't really align to the auspices very equal, which I also like that. You know, they could say that, oh, well, sort of like the, uh, the, the path of the warrior, the, the Eiji, you know, they, they weren't just combatants, frontline combatants, uh, like, like an Aurun would be. You know, they were two different elements comprised of what they were. So they had a lot more depth to them than just the one auspice. No, that's, that's fair. And I mean, there is, there is, uh, definitely more to them. I don't know if that's fair. I don't know. Maybe more to them. I mean, they, they've had more time to work on the auspices than these paths. Certainly. Oh yeah. The, the way I'm looking at it is because they're not one to one with the auspices. You have more room to go outside of what you would consider to be like, usually the territory of the auspice. You don't have exactly the lawyer os. You don't have the lawyer path here, but you could probably take any of them into the more, you know, like, Hey, yeah, let's be the lawmaker. Let's be the one that sets the precedent, but it could work with all of them or none of them. So they're a little less restrained to a defined pre-existing role and they can kind of do their own thing. No, I think that's, that's definitely true. Now, now I think we probably should touch down unless you guys have anything else. I think we should touch down on, on Fox litany. Um, I know, Grant, you've got some stuff you want to talk outside of Kitsune. I know I got some stuff outside of Kitsune. Unless you want to mention their singular camp. I think you want to mention their singular camp, CJ. Tell us about their singular camp. Yeah, it is the Inari's Messengers. And it kind of is what it says on the on the tin. Like, don't have really any dedicated camps. This is the closest thing to one, because apparently they're not as fond of working together. A little more so than the Bastet, but about the same level, honestly, of they kind of don't like hanging out in large numbers, but this is just where they act as messengers from the tribe and around the Hangiokai. So stepping on the Korax's toes just a little bit. But the part that I found really neat is apparently after they've served a amount of time within this camp, they get another tail. Without the rank associated with it or just, mm-hmm. uh, Oh, huh. Yeah, uh, whenever what, whatever one's reason for joining, once the deed is done, the uh, order proves of significant, sufficient merit 
that Luna grants the fox an, a, another tail. Yeah. It, the quote goes on just a little longer to say it's a sign that they have served as a sufficient messenger. All right. Now, see the 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 Luna thing. This is see now we're gonna now we're segueing into the goddamn litany because interesting enough, the fox litany was given to them by Luna, which not Gaia, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's strange because it's so coherent. <laughs> nice. You know, I, I do. I find that interesting because, you know, they don't, they, they give all this credit. You know, I mean, obviously they're guys, children, they were the left, but they get a lot of credit. They give a lot of credit to Luna. They, they have this really strange relationship with Luna, at least in terms, it, it's strange in regard to the rest of the Pharaoh. Mm. You know, they're the kids that spend their summers with the Appy Ann's house versus at home. Right. And somehow they came back. Yeah. yeah. It's the favorite niece of Crazy Aunt Luna. It's impressive. You think no one else would dare. <laughs> I like the fact that Luna gave them these these laws of heaven, these heavenly mandates. But then the very, very last thing is, eh, you can do whatever you need to to achieve our goals. Oh, no, right? And like, and some of these are these are pretty standard. I think you know we know mm-hmm. we've seen a litany before. Destroy what harms Gaia. Age your brothers and sisters that serve Gaia. Revere your mother, aunts, uncles, and favored servants, which read to me like is a, a cross between be humble and the respect all beneath ye are of, all, are of Gaia, mm-hmm. which again, when you talk about how insufferable two thirds of the breeds of Kitsune tend to be, maybe you should have done this one twice. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe moved it up the priority list. Right. Um, keep your duty first in your heart, which is no dicking around with distractions, essentially. And then the rest that we were, were directly worded, I forbid. So I took those, I, I took those as quotes because I kind of appreciated mm-hmm. that. Like Luna forbidding, like fucking you're grounded. Right. Um, I forbid you to exterminate humans. I forbid you to make war with your brothers and sisters. I forbid you to break your word. I forbid you to commit suicide for reasons of honor. It was very specific. And and then, of course, finally, the I for you to do anything else necessary to achieve our goals. Like Grant pointed out. They just fuck it. Whatever. Just get out of jail free. Yeah. Don't do all of that stuff. But if it achieves what we want, eh, fuck it. Go ahead. Yeah. It feels where Luna got involved, right? Mm-hmm. I will say I do enjoy the that first one of the I forbid you from exterminating the humans. Like, not just like, hey, don't eat the flesh of humans like the Garu got, or remember, respect all those below you for all are of Gaia. No, don't eliminate the humans. They need to stay at least a little. Like, just how specific that was. That does also say that they can't eat people. They just can't wipe them out. They mm-hmm. And really, it, how, how literal do you want to take that? Mm-hmm. Like, is, maybe maybe it's fair game as long as you don't call the Orkin man on them. <laughs> or maybe it's fair game as long as you only keep the ones you like. Maybe, you know, don't, don't get a can of Raid when you're, when you're whipping out that town and it might be, it might be all right. Maybe that's what Luna meant. We don't know. It wasn't. She's crazy. <laughs> yeah. it definitely leaves it wide open for, uh, for various interpretations and abuse by the Kitsune overall. <laughs> I just had to get it. I, I had to bring it up, but unless you guys got anything about the Kitsune specifically, you want to touch down on. So, yeah, I think that, um, uh, I, I think we've spoken quite extensively about the Kitsune and everyone's tracking the flexibility that they have. And I think we can really go into some of the other denizens that are in the Far East that are helpful for you know, deepening games so that you're not really pigeonholed into the concepts detailed in the Henge Yokai book. Obviously, we don't have time to get too deep into them, but we can at least you know go through the wave tops and touch base on some of them. Oh, for sure. And just to give a final, a quick final word in the Kitsune, look, I mean, we talked about them a lot. Uh, they're, they're definitely pretty cool. They're, they're unique and indifferent in terms of the Pharaoh, but there's, there's definitely some meat to work with. And again, I encourage you to check out the Hengi Yokai book. You know, yeah, there's, there's changing breeds 20. 
great. There's Shichi Reads Revised. But check out the Hengi Yokai book, you know, the book dedicated to the whole shebang. There's where you want to go if you want to play the setting. And I encourage you to give it a shot. But keeping with the setting and keeping moving away from the Pharah, Grant, would you like to kick us off? Sure. I'm going to go ahead and start and go through with the, uh, the Hisen, right? Which were like the, the changed, for lack of a better term. They're the only changelings? detailed in changelings. Okay. Right. So they have one book that's Land of Eight Million Dreams that is separated into this, right? And the fact that this book exists also threw, throws the question as to why they chose the paths the way they did for the Kitsune into question. Because they have like houses or like roughly equivalent to kiths of the Changeling game. And each one of those were aligned with one of the five elements. Those elements were the Asian elements, you know, metal, fire, wood, earth, and water. So they definitely knew that Asian elements were different than the Western elements, and they still chose to go with the West. My money, somebody found the book that was pushed in the back of the bookshelf behind the others for, at the time they were <laughs> writing the Change League stuff. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, all right, that sounds where that tracks. You know, smart ass was like, oh, I'll show them. <laughs> So those were like the noble kiths of the changelings. And like I said, I'm not going to get too deep into it because this isn't about changeling. But they're kind of like the leaders and they're like the nobility of the changeling world. And then you had commoners who were, instead of being aligned to the elements, they were aligned to animals. You know, snakes, monkeys, fish, cats, and badgers. And you can really start to incorporate those into a Hingi Yokai game because, you know, you have these changelings that can sometimes take the image of other animals and to the average pack, they're not going to see that as a changeling. They're going to see it as, as something crazy and something else. All right. How do you think you best work that? I mean, how would you in a, in a Henge Okai? Or even as its own thing to, to kind of spin off or, or maybe you're bringing uh, your werewolves across, you know, across the pond, across the pond. That doesn't work for Japan. They, they don't do that. But, you know, we have the, the Westerners yeah. visiting, or, or what do we do with it? So, uh, an example, right? You have the, oh, shit, what's that mockery breed with the were-apes? Yeren. The Yeren, thank you. So, you have Yeren, right? And so, you know, some of these Western packs already know about the Yeren, but the Eastern packs don't really, they're not really exposed to them. What they would be exposed to would be the Hanuman, which is the the changelings that have an ability to turn into a monkey, right? It's based on this the, the greatest hero, which is like Hanuman, which is a super uh, jester type creature, super prankster, you know, like a force of, of random chaos. And these these changelings, these Hisen, they they take on a lot of the stereotypical monkey traits, right? The monkey in the circus and things like that. They do trickery. They climb up and down stuff. They're, they're crazy and do all kinds of crazy stuff, right? You can have one of either way. You can either have the West come to the East and see these creatures and think, oh, shit, those are urine. Those are mockery breed very much of the worm. We need to wipe them out and kill them all. Or vice versa, have some urine come into like one of like Hong Kong or Tokyo with, you know, this uh, Pentex type group, you know, Pentex first team, for example. And then the, the beast court is seeing this, this creature that they assume is one of the monkey folk, but in reality is this, you know, orangutan of doom from the worm. That's pretty cool. I think definitely a lot to play with the, um, I mean, we say changeling, and they can change, which is nice. You know, I, I think there's a lot, mm -hmm. uh, there's some good room to play with that, you know, and some antagonists that aren't. Well, I mean, there's a lot of just crazy cool shit over there anyway. But yeah. Something I do like with them that they, they can do um, is that they can, they can mess with luck, like the luck of things, and they can actually use that to calm rages and furies and frenzies of other creatures including changing breeds so say you have you know a pack with a hakan in it and he's losing his damn mind you could actually have this monkey folk sort of just you know bring him out and help him out and pull him out of that rage 
so they can tell the account to calm down it actually works it actually works and it's just a charisma and empathy role that's the crazy thing about changelings like they have they have innate abilities all changelings do they typically have two and for these innate abilities it's just a role there's no like spending you know their equivalent of genosis or anything like that they just through role play through those creatures and those characters they just the mechanics of it is just a simple role that's that's nice. And in fact, that's nice from a storyteller standpoint because it's it's right. one less thing to have to, to juggle in the middle mm-hmm. of a game. I could appreciate that. Now, I brought something too. I'm going in from a little bit of a different angle than you did, Grant. But I wanted to talk about a bit of the. I don't want to say the the hunter Japanese version of the hunt, but it is right. It just it came before Hunter, and this is Demon Hunter X. Um, which I believe uh, you have a copy of now, don't you, Grant? I do. Thank you very much for that, actually. Yep. I did not have a copy, and it was one of the... There's only one other book from the Kinder to the East and the Year of the East uh, grouping that I actually don't have, so I appreciate that quite a bit. Oh, no problem. It turns out I had two copies of that book somehow, and I'm underlining the somehow. So, uh, Grant, I uh, got a free copy of Demon Hunter X. But Demon Hunter X, yeah, it, they're essentially it's the um, it's Hunter, but it's again it, it it's not the imbued or anything like that. It, it's um, in Demon Hunter X, you they're they're known as the Shen, uh, the the Denzies of the World of Darkness. You know your your shapeshifters, your your vampires, everything is labeled is is Shen. You know the Night People, and um, your your titular characters are are called the She. Who, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the one force there. It's the ones you would play as if you're playing the game. And they understand that the Shen have a place in the natural order of things. By contrast, there, there's a second force out there, uh, called Strike Force Zero, which is the Japanese government's technologically advanced, you know, secret, you know, secret branch of the government kind of thing. Um, you know, one's trying to enforce the natural order, one's trying to reshape it. But again, you're playing as the she. And it's, uh, I, I really kind of dig this as a concept. Again, it's, it's not werewolf, and I know this is the werewolf pod. Look, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, I think the, the, the thing about the she is, you know, uh, mostly, uh, they, they choose their disciples. Um, and normally from surviving victims of the Shen, those who've been attacked by or been orphaned by, you know, the, the, the lone survivor of the vampire attack or somehow someone who somehow got away from, uh, you know, uh, frenzying Simabito because Jossum, you know, the, the, the person that survived and it's, um, you know, they are just mortal, but they learn through rigorous training and meditation um, to manipulate their chi, uh, which is what gives them their gifts, and um, to bypass stuff like the delirium through this, this, you know, this mental training and the uh, meditation. Um, you know, these are, these are kind of darker characters, right? You know, they're, they're still human. They don't have special uh, soak powers. They don't have special you know, longevity. So like physically they can fall apart pretty quick. You know, they'll train for 10 years to go into battle and maybe last four rounds. Who knows? Meanwhile, you have strike force zero, which again is uh, very little in common with the she, except for they fight demons. You know, that that's, that's the thing they have in common. You know, it's, it's a top secret agency known only to the highest echelons of Japanese government. And it was created by a man named uh, Genshin Okamoto, who was an actual ninja that didn't officially exist before World War II. And that's a sentence that I like just on its own. I really like the fact that the book really detailed some crossover possibilities. You know, Strike Force Zero is just begging to be integrated into Mage with uh, the technocracy. Um, if you're into that, like that's a really good segue into that. You know, they only really have two books that detail the She of Strike Force Zero in any detail. You have, obviously, Demon Hunter X, which is the meat and potatoes of it. And then the actual World of Darkness Time of Judgment book, like the the last book of, like, all these different things. In the Kinder of the East portion, 
they have some scenarios that actually use a lot of those those characters to influence the, what's going on in those scenarios. See, that's pretty cool. Like, as I'm going through the book, you know, you they really detailed the backgrounds of the Shi and Strike Force Zero. You know, like they went into the the stories of how they were created and the first people, a lot of legends, and I skipped a lot of it because that's an interesting story and all, but if I told you about it, you wouldn't look into it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I liked, I liked the whole deal with the Strike Force Zero, right? This, this uh, Okamoto, how, like an, a ninja that didn't exist before World War II. Okay. Who, who had two paranormal encounters, but I thought the philosophy behind it, right, is that one of these demon encounters he had was that one that could see the future and told him about Nagasaki, obviously before the bomb. So when it came true, right, he totally freaks out because now it's not only do these demons exist, you know, the demons being our catch-all term here, but that they can see the future. And if they could see the future, they can manipulate the future. And we can't have monsters manipulating the future of humankind. And that was basically, you know, the origin point for the Strike Force Zero. But, you know, basically you look at these two different factions. And again, and you're, you're playing as a member, uh, as, as a member of the Shi, you know, who don't normally get into a group, but you can get a group of three of your friends and do these bombastic kind of darker, maybe Kill Bill inspired games. But basically they're both Batman. Like the she are Batman is just, it's Batman, right? You're a guy, you went, you had some trauma, you went through the training and now you're out there doing the thing. But then like straight for zero is what happens if Bruce Wayne made Batman a branch of the military. It's definitely a very interesting spin on Hunter. And if I remember correctly, we got to see a bit of that in the Bloodlines one game in a unofficial patched mission. It was, um, it was a mission that had been cut that had been patched back in by fans and apparently it was a mission where you're working with a demon hunter to go and kill a uh what she what the character calls a hangyokai which is just a sam maybito that showed up in the city and it's like from what you described she's very much one of the uh she and like i never knew about that until hearing you start talking about demon hunter x it's like yeah no this is fucking spot on that's kind of awesome and kind of hilarious because they chose sam maybito <laughs> Mm-hmm. You mean the new <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Sharks aren't real. It's a trick by the new Yep. I was just going to say that only people who've been listening for a long time are going to really get that joke. That's fine. You're welcome. That's, see, that's the kind of reward we, we pepper in every now and then for our longtime listeners. <laughs> sort of like all the Olympics jokes that keep jumping out of holes from time to time. See what you did there. Uh, did you? Some, sometimes I don't want a lawnmower blade. <laughs> that shit happened to me once. That was not a fun day. I think that's probably a story for another time. You know, Mr. Eight Toad Porter. Eight Toad? Yeah, I mean, kicked into a lawn, uh, lawnmower blade and can't have all your toes after something like that. But I will say, yeah, the, the Demon Hunter X I thought was very cool. And it's, again, it's not a Hengi Yokai game. But I, I liked that idea of um, that, that, that hunter, uh, you know, that different take on hunter that is pretty cool. And that, that idea with the, the strike force zero in, in the, the contrast with the, she, even in the D- demon hunter X book, like he even talks about how some of like, some of what I said about strike force zero is bullshit. Like in the course of it, they're like, Oh, here's the story uh, of, Strike for zero. Look at how neat this government secret thing is. Also, half of what we just said was bullshit. Here's, here's some more about it later. And then again, like I mentioned earlier, there is that section that kind of explains what anime is, which is just adorable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of even just modern day anime that you could really start taking inspiration from if you wanted to run a Hank Yokai or Demon Hunter X game at this point. Oh, absolutely. Um, definitely. I mean, if you're looking for inspiration, I mean, yeah, there's plenty of anime out there. You know, I don't know a whole lot of modern ones, frankly, it's, it's on me, but you know, I look at stuff like you could build something around something like paranoia agent. You could, you could find inspiration in the classics like Cowboy Bebop or Neon Genesis Evangelion. Um, there's a level of Inuyasha with the general, um, like, especially with the Umbra of, of the Hengioka, you know, of the, of the East, you could go to, over here to some of our movies, something like uh, Kill Bill or Big Trouble in Little China. You know, it, it's, it's a setting that you can just fucking relax and have fun in 
and, and it's different enough to be a nice change of pace, but it's similar enough to still kind of feel like home in, in certain ways. You know, I think everyone should play around with the setting a little bit, just even for a couple, you know, a couple chapter stories just to have fun. Yeah, yeah, I, I concur. And there's there's books out there for each splat in this overall setting. They, they really did kind of create a an Eastern version of the World of Darkness. And depending on, it doesn't matter which splat you prefer, you know, werewolf or vampire or whatever, you can actually go through and enjoy that overall setting with your preferred splat. You know, Mage has the Dragons of the East book. Vampire has all the different tri or different clans that are involved with the East, like the Ravenos or the Onda or whoever. You have Lord mm-hmm. of Darkness Hong Kong. One of the major political conflicts in Wraith is between the East and the West. So you, you can really branch out and start looking into these things to add a variety to your game. And then as you said, because it's all based on this fictionalized pop cultural type history, you can take it anywhere. You could, you can redo your game as Big Trouble in Little Chinatown, uh, but with Shin, and have a fantastic time. Or another possible idea that you could do for bringing in more Hengioka into your normal game as a setup? What if they're trying to branch out of just the East? They've got everything working on their end of the street. Maybe they could help others. And what kind of conflicts does that bring in whenever you start getting those culture clashes? Certainly. You could also do the fish out of water where your um, your pack has to go overseas to the Beast Courts to deal with something briefly. Perhaps a Stargazer has a sick mentor who's over there, or a Shadow Lord ally or pack member has a distant relation who is in the Haken who needs help. You know, uh, with things like that, you don't want to overstay your welcome in, in either case. But there's definitely room for something there. Unless you guys have anything else, I, I think that's about our time today. Yeah, we covered a good bit on the Kitsune and like wrapped up the last bits of the rest of the Eastern World of Darkness for the most part. Saying, so, yeah, you, there's a lot that you can do with this whole um, with the whole setting, and I'm going to take every opportunity I can to, you know, shoehorn Kurt Russell from uh, Big Trouble in Little Chinatown into every game I can, you know, and I encourage you to do so as well. Add that comedic relief in there. And I, I definitely agree. And, and I will say that, uh, that is about our time, but, uh, this has been old Porter Burton with the pork chop express. I'd like to thank you. <laughs> you made that happen. That's your fault. Grant. <laughs> uh, see that. If you haven't seen that movie, see that movie immediately trick or treat. That's, that's your treat. Is that recommendation? We know Grant, CJ, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. You know, Lots our, of fun. Our um, technical difficulties aside, it's always great to hang out with you guys. Mm-hmm. And um, we'll. You're welcome, Danny. Happy anniversary. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, everybody. Say happy, aniver- happy belated anniversary to Danny. That's why he's not here today. And uh, on behalf of him and his wife, who are. That's none of our business. Uh, <laughs> CJ, Grant, and myself, uh, we want to say thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, thank you for your support. We'll, we'll see you next week. You take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Keep your claws sharp. Your head in a swivel. And we'll see you. It's the favorite niece of Crazy Aunt Luna. <laughs>